The floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. It's really an honor. Uh, can I ask for the presentation? Can I ask for the presentation? Already, already there. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. It's already open. Yeah. Thank you very much. <coughs> so once again, thank you very much. Uh, at this point, I would like to talk to you about uh, Leti Upisku, the memorial of the Holocaust of the Roma and Sinti in Bohemia. Uh, or not. Yes, perfect. <laughs> uh, so, as I'm not sure how many of you are aware about uh, the history of this place, I will short, shortly try to present what actually happened there and why we are building a memorial. Uh, on the 2nd of August 1942, Tag der Erfassung der Zogoyne has happened in the whole protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. 6,500 Roma and Sinti was counted, and some of them was already, from the point, sent to the so-called gypsy camps. The one was uh, built at Lati Upisku for Bohemian, and the, sec the second one was uh, at Hodoni Ukunstatu for Moravian Roma and Sinti. Uh, 1,309 Roma and Sinti entered the so-called gypsy camp during the first month of its working. Uh, the capacity of the camp was approximately 300 personnel. So you can imagine the horrible conditions that the prisoners have to live in. Uh, the camp was uh, assigned for not only the, the adult men, but for whole families. Men, women and children have to be interned there. After they entered the camp, they went through a really horrible and uh, not dignified uh, ceremony when they were uh, stripped of all their uh, belongings, all their clothes. Uh, their hair and whole body was uh, washed and shaved. And they, the families were separated. Men lived separately, women and smallest children. All of them were living in small barracks, who were approximately 2.5 uh, meters uh, high, uh, wide and 3 meters uh, in length. And in the one barracks should live approximately 4 to 6 persons. In the camp, approximately 10 to 16 persons lived in one barrack. Uh, they had no proper uh, heating, they had no proper blankets, it was overcrowded and very soon it became uh, full of uh, lice and uh, other insects. There was no, not enough food, mostly because uh, the guards are, were actually stealing the food. So very soon uh, all the personnel, all the victims became starved. Each day, 10 till 12 hours, they had to work. Really hard labor in Curie, in the woods, all women, men and children. All children above 10 years old were supposed to work. Uh, can I, next slide please? On this picture uh, that was uh, actually drawn by one of the survivors, you can see how some of the prisoners were punished, either for uh, not obeying the orders or for trying to escape. Uh, the guards, well, all of them were Czech guards. They were uh, sometimes uh, uh, ex-gendarmes. And uh, according to the reports and according to the uh, testimonies, most of them were really cru cruel. Uh, soon the transport, can I ask for more? Soon uh, the transport to uh, the concentration camp Auschwitz, uh, Auschwitz to Birkenau started. And uh, in uh, May 1943, uh, the biggest transport had happened. And uh, the youngest person who, were, who was transported to Auschwitz was only one month old. The oldest one, Franciszek Richter, was 87 years old. 
uh, because of the conditions and because there was not enough food and really hard labor, the death rate in the camp was quite large. More than 300 uh, people died during the time of the camp. Most of them were children. Approximately 327 person died and more than 240 person of them were children. Uh, during the winter 1943, uh, the epidemic of uh, typhoid uh, has started and uh, there was nothing really done to prevent it. There was a quarantine on the camp and uh, as it was lived in May, it was lived only because uh, the transportation needed to be to begun. At first, those who died were buried at the cemetery at Mirovice, which was a small city close uh, to Lati. But uh, after the epidemic, the mass graves beyond the camp was uh, started and approximately uh, more than 100 personnel, most of them children, was buried at the place. After the war, only 10% of uh, Bohemian, and Moravian, Roma and uh, Sinti survived the war. According to some historians, this is the most thorough genocide as from uh, the first 6,500 Roma and Sinti from protectorate, approximately 800 has returned or survived the war. What happened to the place? Uh, the, can I ask? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, the camp was destroyed in the August 1943. The whole place was torn down, dis uh, disinfected, and then uh, the whole area was burned. So nothing really left after the camp. Only you could, you could see at the time uh, the lines of the barracks, but it was all, nothing left. Uh, in the 60s, we know that a cross, a wooden cross, was raised at the place of the mass graves. It was raised uh, by the family of one of the victims who actually survived. Unfortunately, uh, in the 17s, the pig farm was built right next to the camp. Uh, you can see the pic uh, those are nowadays pictures of the pig farm. Uh, in the 70s was built, uh, has been built 10 halls and in 80s uh, and 90s three more halls have been built. Most of them were below the camp next to the big road but uh, some of them, uh, the area already covered in 90s the area of the former so-called gypsy camp. Uh, in the 60s Uh, in the 60s, the first commemoration plaque was uh, put at the Mirovice Cemetery. Uh, in the 90s, uh, the others uh, were followed, as you can see on uh, the picture. And uh, those are carrying the names of the victims who were actually buried at this place. In 1995, the memorial by Zdeněk Hula, as you can see on the picture's left, uh, was raised. And uh, Václav Havel, our former president, the president of the Czech Republic at the time, has actually uh, presented this place. This was the first commemoration act at Leti. Uh, in 2019, the whole area was given to Lidice Memorial to, uh, to administer it. And, but the, at the same time, the pig farm was still there, still functioning. And during all the commemoration ceremonies, uh, it was almost unbearable to be there because the smell of the pig farm, as you can probably imagine, was quite terrible. Uh, in the whole 90s and later on, uh, there were lots of, uh, uh, lots of protests against the pig farm. The voices were raising to actually buy out the pig farm from the by the state and to remove this uh, undignifying thing that was raised on the, uh, on the place of the former gyps so-called gypsy camp. Only in uh, 2018, so last year, it finally happened. After more than 20 years of protests by Roma, Sinti, by the scholars, 
by the uh, Czech society, by the international society. So it's my honor to actually present to you that last year the pig farm was bought out and the whole area was given to administer to the Museum of Romanic Culture in Brno. And currently we are preparing to build a memorial there. So what will happen from now on? Uh, at these days, we are preparing everything necessary for the architectural competition to start. We want the competition to be two rounds, international, open, anonymous. So we are hoping in the best result of the proper, proper memorial for the victims of the Roma Holocaust to stand at the place of the memory. Uh, at this time, the pig farm is still there, not functioning, but the holes, holes are still there. And we are waiting for the end of the competition to start the demolition, as we want to uh, know what the memory will look like, so the demolition could be as effective as possible. Uh, currently, uh, at these uh, following months, there will be done another archaeological research, as one was done in 2017 by uh, Dr. Vateka and his team. But uh, the archaeological research was done beyond uh, the area of the pig farm, as uh, the researchers were not allowed on the premises of the pig farm. Uh, small archaeological research was done at the places of the mass graves, and more will follow before uh, the demolition will start, and of course after that. And we are hoping to uh, find more information about the camp, as uh, we know that Tutsin uh, Vateka already found uh, small pieces from the belongings of the victims that are uh, able to prove how the persons actually lived there and that a uh, lot of women and a lot of children were imprisoned in Leti. Uh, the pig farm was bought out by the Czech Republic and the memorial will be mainly funded by the Norway funds, which we are very grateful for. Uh, currently, we are also starting uh, to prepare ourselves to build uh, an, an exhibition. We believe that the Latin memorial should, not be, should be the place of piety, of commemoration for the families of the victims to come there and to uh, remember their uh, their families and, their, and its victims. But we also believe that uh, the place should be a place for education, for dialogue, to learn about what happened there. We believe that it's necessary that all the visitors who will come to Leti, not only to pay their respect, but to also find out what happened, how it could happen, and that it should not happen again. Because uh, the story of Letty is not only the story of the so-called gypsy camp, but also the story of forgetting about what happened during the Second World War and what it could mean for the future. We really hope that uh, the Letty Memorial will become the place for dialogue and for the future generations to learn about the Roma Holocaust, about the victims of Letty, also uh, thanks to the memories that we are uh, in possession. So this is the future, and uh, we believe that in the year 2023, we will open the memorial, and I am kindly welcoming you all to come to the opening ceremony, even though it's in four years. Um, thank you, thank you very much. It's been indeed an encouraging uh, news that this very important place of Roma suffering is going to be properly commemorated in a dignified way, and that the infamous story of the pig farm uh, in Latvia is coming to an end. Thank you. And now um, the floor is yours, Mr. Katsozik, Auschwitz Birkenau State Museum.
I'm not visible, <laughs> sorry. Będę mówił po polsku. Pozwólcie Państwo, ja się napisałem tekst po angielsku, ale myślę, że mówimy też dzisiaj dużo o wolności, a ja chciałbym być wolny w tym przekazie, choć szybki, bo dziesięciominutowy. Pierwsze to chciałbym wytłumaczyć tutaj moją obecność. Rozwijamy bardzo intensywnie program romski. I tak to nazywamy na roboczo bardzo, ale chciałbym też powiedzieć, że muzeum, które powstało, Muzeum Auschwitz-Birkenau, które powstało w 1947 roku, a od 1946 roku już miało pierwszych odwiedzających, od początku jego istnienia historia ofiar Zigeunerlager była obecna w przekazach przewodników, którymi byli głównie byli więźniowie polityczni Auschwitz. Była obecna, ale tak jak powiedział profesor Kapralski, były to, była to opowieść Kazimierza Smolenia i jego przewodnik. Ja może... Była to opowieść Kazimierza Smolenia, jego przewodnik, innych byłych więźniów, takich jak profesor historii Władysław Bartoszew, w, w, przepraszam, Wacław Długoborski. I to, ten, to, to znalazło swoje odbicie w tej starej wystawie, która jest obecna do tej pory, w stałej wystawie w Auschwitz z 1955 roku. Państwo, większość z was byliście wczoraj i przedwczoraj na terenie miejsca pamięci i nie muszę przypominać, ile, w ilu miejscach historia Romów w różnych aspektach, czy to dzieci romskich, czy to deportowanych do Auschwitz, czy to y, śladów po eksperymentach medycznych, czy opis chorób, które występowały w obozie. Przy tym wszystkim historia obozu Zigeuner Lager i jego ofiar, i jego więźniów jest obecna. Zawsze przewodnicy w Auschwitz wymieniają te cztery podstawowe grupy ofiar. Te cztery największe grupy ofiar. To jakby symbolicznie przedstawia to zdjęcie. Żydzi, Polacy, Sinti i Romowie, jeńcy sowieccy. Wow. To nerwy, ale zaraz je opanuję. Nie, czego? Jest. To jest fragment przewodnika, który był wydany, przewodnika takiego książkowego, wydanego przez, w Polsce w 1980 roku, autorstwa właśnie Kazimierza Smolenia i fragment poświęcony Zigeuner Lager. To, co mówiłem, opis warunków mieszkaniowych. Praktycznie każdy z przewodników, który opowiada o warunkach mieszkaniowych, pokazując te prycze w Birkenau, mówi, zobaczcie, na takich pryczach były umieszczane całe rodziny romskie. Wracam jeszcze raz do tego przekazu, który był obecny, obecny w Auschwitz przed rokiem 89. I teraz kolejna sprawa i ogromna zmiana dokonana poprzez wystawę tak zwaną wystawę narodową, jedną z wystaw narodowych, obok wystawy stałe istnieją stałe wystawy narodowe, jedyna unikalna wystawa narodowa kogoś, kto nie ma państwa. Mamy wystawę francuską, mamy wystawę holenderską. Wszystkie te przynależne są państwom i są związane z konkretnymi deportowanymi z konkretnego kraju. Tutaj wyjątkowa wystawa która doprowadziła do tego, że ten y, rozwój y, działań związanych y, z, z pamięcią romską jakby nabrał większej aktywności, większego obszaru. To tutaj odbywają się... Że to już nie nerwy. To tutaj odbywają się liczne warsztaty, zajęcia edukacyjne, zarówno dla nauczycieli, jak i dla, 
jak i dla uczniów, jest to blok bardzo często wykorzystywany przez niemieckie grupy studyjne z Niemiec, ale także i z Polski i z innych krajów, o czym będę mówił. Towarzyszyła temu też rozwój działalności takiej publikacyjnej. I jest złośliwy. Działalność wydawnicza. I tutaj wydajemy taką serię tak zwanych głosów pamięci, Voices of Memory. I tutaj udało nam się wydać we współpracy właśnie dzięki profesorowi Kapralskiemu, pani Joannie Talewicz-Kwiatkowskiej, jak i Marii Martyniak, ten jeden numer przeznaczony dla nauczycieli głównie oraz naszych przewodników, poświęcony losowi Sinti i Romów w Auschwitz. Wraz z rozwojem działalności publikacyjnej wypełnialiśmy też przestrzeń wirtualną. I chodzi tutaj przede wszystkim o powstałą lekcję, otwartą lekcję internetową, dostępną dla każdego na stronie internetowej w językach angielskim i polskim, która poświęcona jest także pamięci czy historii obozu romskiego. Teraz chciałem powiedzieć o projektach, w których temat Sinti i Romów jest obecny. W zasadzie każdy większy projekt, czy, czy chodzi o Akademie Letnie, czy chodzi o studia podyplomowe, totalitaryzm, nazizm, holokaust, czy też o programy duże dla szkół, są wypełniane przez, przez obecność tego wątku romskiego. I chciałbym tu powiedzieć, że bardzo ważnym projektem w ubiegłym roku, finansowanym ze środków Ministerstwa Edukacji Narodowej był projekt pod nazwą Obywatele II Rzeczpospolitej w KL Auschwitz. Ten projekt i materiały do tego projektu zawarte są na naszej stronie internetowej. Wybraliśmy w tym projekcie, chce, chcieliśmy pokazać Polskę przedwojenną, Polskę wielokulturową, Polskę, która zaczęła się rozwijać dynamicznie i w 1939 roku najazd Niemiec hitlerowskich na Polskę. I losy kilku wybranych młodych ludzi, którzy trafili wtedy do Auschwitz. Wybraliśmy, między, wybraliśmy sześć osób, między innymi jednym z nich jest Edward Paczkowski. Jego losy śledzą uczniowie z Polski w, całej, w, całej, w całym naszym kraju. Projekt dostępny jest nie tylko po polsku, ale i po angielsku i w języku hebrajskim. Edward Paczkowski, tutaj akurat jest zdjęcie jednego z ostatnich, z końcowych fragmentów krótkich przesłań tych sześciu osób, które, których biografię wybraliśmy do projektu. I Edward Paczkowski mówi o tym, co w Polsce jest tak istotne i ważne i tak bardzo często podnoszone. Mówi o tym, jak on kocha ten kraj, jak on chciał tutaj wrócić, jak bo, bo wie, że może kogoś tutaj jeszcze spotka, bo wie, że może kogoś jeszcze zobaczy, bo wie, że tak kocha tę ziemię. I mówi o drugiej sprawie, o tym, co dla niego w jego życiu jest tak istotne i ważne, o wierze. Mówi o swoim wierze w Boga, o swoim odniesieniu właśnie, dlaczego wraca do tego kraju. Był, i to też jest istotne, był więźniem Auschwitz, dlatego, że był aktywnym członkiem polskiego ruchu oporu. To też jest Taka ciekawostka. Chcemy, mamy ogromną grupę przewodników. Przewodników ponad 350 już w tej chwili, oprowadzających w 22 językach różnych. I dlatego staramy się, tym bardziej staramy się o podnoszenie 
ich kwalifikacji, poziomu. Stąd cieszymy się niezwykle na współpracę między innymi z Centrum Dokumentacji Sinti Romów w Heidelbergu. Tutaj zdjęcie z czerwca tego roku. Seminarium dla 50 polskich przewodników z Auschwitz w Heidelbergu. Kilkudniowe z udziałem ekspertów z Uniwersytetu i z Centrum. To jest szansa na to, że będziemy jeszcze lepiej wypełniać swoją misję, bo rozumiemy i chcę to podkreślić, że te cztery główne pamięci, to tylko są cztery główne pamięci, tych pamięci jest jeszcze znacznie więcej, ale żadna z tych pamięci nie może wykluczać innej. I myślę, że to jest naszym ogromnym przesłaniem. Każda pamięć tłumaczy tę następną i każda pamięć wypełnia przestrzeń Auschwitz. Tylko wtedy ona tam funkcjonuje. Prowadzimy też program absolutnie unikalny w Polsce. To jest program Romana Szperanca. Program, który w którym zaangażowaliśmy polskich nauczycieli, a także polskich uczniów, którzy mają możliwość przyjazdu do Auschwitz i do Oświęcimia, biorą udział w warsztatach w Stowarzyszeniu Romów w Polsce, a także biorą udział w zajęciach na terenie Auschwitz-Birkenau oraz w zajęciach podsumowujących. Taki jeden dzień studyjny śladami Romów w Auschwitz specjalnie poświęcony właśnie Rom. I e, t, t, chciałem podkreślić znowu współpracę z organizacjami romskimi. Tutaj Stowarzyszenie Romów w Polsce, wcześniej podkreślałem Heidelberg oraz niezwykle cenię sobie obecność w zespole Międzynarodowego Centrum Edukacji Auschwitz i Holokauście jako eksperta i doradcy akademickiego panią dr Joannę Talewicz-Kwiatkowską. To jest fundamentalna zmiana. Jesteśmy obecni też przy i wspieramy, pomagamy, staramy się współorganizować obchody i różnego rodzaju upamiętnienia. Tutaj dla, to są obchody 2 sierpnia. Dla porównania, jak to się rozwinęło, rok 1999, Pan Romani Roze, Roman Kwiatkowski, marszałek Senatu, Alicja Grześkowiak, z tyłu polscy więźniowie polityczni, między innymi Jerzy Bielecki i tutaj przed dwoma laty namioty w czasie, w czasie obchodów. Przestrzeń pomnikowa uzupełniana jest jeszcze i tu jeszcze chcę jedno zdanie dodać, o przestrzeń wirtualną, wirtualne zwiedzanie Auschwitz, które uwzględnia w szeroki sposób wątki romskie. Druga i drugi element to są tak zwane, to są relacje y, dotyczące Zigeuner Lager i jego ofiar obecne na terenie Birkenau w tak zwanych QR kodach. Na rampie kolejowej w Birkenau, y, przy ruinach krematorium, przy barakach mieszkalnych. To wszystko tworzy ten krajobraz pamięci na terenie byłego niemieckiego obozu Auschwitz-Birkenau. Dziękuję Państwu za uwagę. Thank you, thank you very much. I must say that uh, I've been visiting uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum since 1980. Uh, nine for professional reasons with study groups uh, that means for 30 years and i can say that the transformation of this place is uh, enormous this is an entirely uh, different place than 30 years ago regarding for example the way in which the memories of uh, roma and sinti are presented there okay now auschwitz birkenau the area of this uh, of, of auschwitz birkenau is emblematic for the history of the Holocaust and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum uh, is emblematic for the museum representation of the uh, Holocaust. Therefore, it's my pleasure to give the floor now to Paul Shapiro from the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. The floor is yours.
There we go. That's working now. First, I want to add my thanks to the organizers of this important conference. The issues that are being raised and debated here are truly critical if we are going to succeed in ensuring memory of the Romani victims of discrimination, persecution, and murder during the Holocaust era. The challenge, in addition to presenting accurate history, is to present the history of what occurred on this continent three quarters of a century ago effectively enough to have an impact on the future, to combat the racism and anti-Roma prejudice that continue in Europe today. If we can do that through our representations, then we will give meaning even at this late date, to the lives and to the deaths of Roma victims whose lives were taken away before they could fulfill their own individual potentials on this earth. I agree with a lot of what has been said. In my few minutes, I'd like to take a different approach uh, and comment on three themes, each of which will be important in creating new spaces of memory, that is, in developing effective representation of the Roma experience in institutions. My three themes are diversity, sources, and research. Diversity. My point here is a simple one. We've gathered to commemorate the fact that 75 years ago, German authorities murdered up to 5,000 Sinti and Roma who were imprisoned in the so-called Gypsy family camp in Auschwitz-Birkenau. These murders were horrendous, and the iconic stature of Auschwitz as symbol of the Holocaust can create the impression that this was the experience of Roma that merits remembrance and study. It is certainly one of them, but it is vitally important to focus also on the fact that following the Axis invasion of the USSR, Roma were hunted down and shot to death across the entirety of occupied Soviet territory. Romanian authorities deported 25,000 Roma from Romania into the strip of southwestern Ukraine that they administered, so-called Transnistria, where over half of the deportees died of starvation, disease, and execution the independent state of Croatia, Hungary, Vichy France, and Slovakia, all imposed discriminatory restrictions on Roma and engaged in policies that ranged from differing forms of persecution and incarceration to deportation and murder. Just as was the case with Jews, the persecution, deportation, and murder of Roma was a continent-wide phenomenon. Even when the immediate task is to create, for example, a special exhibition for a particular <coughs> authentic site of persecution, providing that broader continent-wide context and making clear the continent-wide nature of the crime and the diversity of forms of persecution suffered by the victims will increase the impact of the story being presented. Second subject, sources. It's clear today in the aftermath of the collapse of communist regimes in Eastern Europe and the USSR 
and following the opening of long restricted archives in Western Europe. And thanks to a number of projects to interview and video record Roma survivors, that we have at our disposal significant source material with which to update and reinvigorate our representation of the fate of Roma during the Holocaust. Access to archives in the former communist states and the release in many of those states of the archives of state security services has opened up massive new research opportunities including regarding the Roma. The archives of the International Tracing Service in Bad Arlson, Germany, a full copy of which exists here in Poland at the Institute of National Remembrance, contains significant documentation regarding Roma who were incarcerated in concentration camps, used as forced laborers, and more. The forced labor compensation programs of the early 2000s resulted in remarkably powerful documentation being assembled by the International Organization for Migration in Geneva, Switzerland. If you haven't seen that, you must. The Achad in Unum Association in Paris, led by Father Patrick Debois, has collected testimony of Romani survivors in Romania, Moldova, and elsewhere. Testimonies that are sometimes in the local language and sometimes in Romanes. Representation of the Roma experience in institutions will be stronger if it makes use of the full diversity of sources that were not accessible up to now but are available to us today. The third point, research. My point here is really a simple one. It is essential as we design new institutions and new presentations to continue to produce new research on the Roma experience. Much of the new source material that I just mentioned has never been subjected to serious investigation. And it's precisely new research that will clarify questions that have been impossible to answer up to now and that will enhance our ability to present that full diversity of Roma experience of which I spoke earlier. Some people here today know that my museum has begun a process designed to update our permanent exhibition, an exhibition that is 30 years old. We must do it because the research produced over the last 20, 25 years requires that we change parts of the exhibition to ensure its accuracy and to reflect new knowledge to be better balanced, and to be more effective. As we discuss here representation of the Roma experience, we have to plan for future research initiatives to ensure that we're able to improve our teaching of the Roma experience, and that we will be ready when the time comes to incorporate new knowledge into what we exhibit and teach today. This brings me back, in closing, to my first comment. Success is going to be measured, of course, by our historical accuracy. But in an equal measure, success will be measured by the impact that we can have in the fight against contemporary anti-Roma prejudice, anti-Gypsyism, and discrimination. <laughs> Some of you, perhaps, have listened to the remarks made by Professor Raoul Hilberg, one of the founders of the field of Holocaust studies, at a symposium on Roma and Sinti understudied victims of Nazism that took place at our museum in the year 2000, 20 years ago. 
The audio file of what he said is on our website. I think it's critical to remember that online is also a space of memory and representation, as important as textbooks, as important as exhibitions. We need to focus some attention here on the online possibilities as well. Let me go back to Raoul Hilberg. Hilberg described the Jewish experience and the Roma experience during the Holocaust as inextricably linked. And he explained the multiple ways in which these experiences were similar, including, of course, that both were the result of continent-wide prejudices, and both produced Europe-wide tragedy. He concluded, and I want to quote him directly, by saying, if we want to build a world in which there is justice for all, where do we start? The answer, he said, is with the Roma. The work that the people gathered here can do and help create, as Hilberg said, a world in which there is justice for all. The research collections and program opportunities of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum that includes fellowships and workshop opportunities. They are available for you to do this work. I encourage you to make use of those opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's particularly important to uh, remember that uh, museum is not only the place of a visual representation of the past, and not only the place for commemorative rituals, but maybe first of all, it's a place to store the sources for the past and to do research. So in this way, museums are contemporary, modern houses of study where we are learning the past, uh, and this is their most important role. Um, now, um, moving to the next speaker, um, uh, it is very important that uh, Roma history is represented in various public institutions, like state museums. But it is perhaps even more important that Roma history is presented and represented by Roma themselves, that Roma take their history in their own hands. And I guess that this is going to be the uh, topic of the presentation of Irina Spataru. Uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Make it work. And, no? Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Amale, te avensaste tai bahtale, and good afternoon. I will speak in English, don't worry. <laughs> um, I would like to thank you, Anna, very much uh, for inviting and Eriak, of course. I'm very glad uh, to be here and to speak on behalf of the Dikena Bistar Initiative on Ternipe and also in my new capacity as junior expert on behalf of ODIR and uh, the contact point for Roma and Sinti issues. Five years ago, I came here to Krakow and participated in the Dikena Bistar event and the Roma Genocide Remembrance Initiative for the first time. For the first time, together with more than 1,000 other youngsters from all over Europe, I had not only the chance to visit the Auschwitz Museum and to learn about the Roma and Sinti genocide and about human rights, 
but also to meet and to talk to Roma and Sinti who survived the Holocaust. This experience was truly life-changing, I have to say this. For the first time, I understood that this almost forgotten Holocaust that in school books was only mentioned in one single sentence was actually acknowledged, recognized, and commemorated every year at the memorial site of the Zigeuner Lager of the former concentration camp of Auschwitz-Birkenau. After I returned home to Austria, I realized that in the capital city of the country, where more than 90% of the Austrian Roma and Sinti population was deported and murdered during the Second World War, there was no memorial site, no, nor was the 2nd of August recognized as an official Remembrance Day. Uh, maybe you can just go through the, these are just some pictures from the event. Uh, yeah, just, uh, yeah, some uh, of the 1,000 people that were there in 2014 uh, in Auschwitz and in the museum. Uh, yeah, we can stop here. Um, in 2015, after the resolution on the recognition of the 2nd of August as European Roma Holocaust Memorial Day was passed in the European Parliament and member states were called on to establish an European Memorial Day together with my young colleague Samuel Mago and with the support of the organizations Romano Centro and Edizione Exil, we decided to bring Diki Nabistar to Vienna and to organize a youth commemoration at the Chaya Stoika Square in the 7th District. Um, yeah, this is Chaya Stoika Square. Um, Chaya Stoika was an Austrian Romanian artist who survived um, the three concentration camps, Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, uh, and Ravensbrück, uh, when she was a little girl. The square next to the church, in the, you can see the church also in the pic picture, where she went every Sunday was dedicated after she died in 2000, uh, was dedicated to her after she died in 2013, and represents for us today a place not only to remember her as an artist, as an activist, and as a survivor, but also to remember the fate of half a million Roma and Sinti that were killed by the Nazis. Yeah. So these are the pictures. This is Chaya Stoika. Okay. Um, under the motto Dike Nabistar, every year on the 2nd of August, we commemorate the Roma and Sinti genocide with the participation of young Roma and non-Roma on the Chaya Stoika Square in Vienna. Every year, we raise our voice against the forgetting and against the racism uh, and the discrimination Roma and Sinti are still facing nowadays, everywhere in Europe. Every year, we call on the Austrian state to officially recognize the European Roma Holocaust Memorial Day and to erect a memorial in the city center of Vienna in order to have an appropriate place to remember that what took place should never happen again. Yeah. These are the uh, speakers, the young speakers uh, on the commemoration event in Vienna, the act of commemoration. Yes. Okay. And one more. Good. Um, you saw there, uh, sorry, can you go back? <laughs> can you go back? Yeah, thank you. Um, however, let's have a look uh, at other European countries, since this is an international conference. And in my capacity as junior expert at the ordinary contact point for Roma and Sinti issues, um, and I'm working there mainly on activities on Sinti, Roma and Sinti youth initiatives, but also on the topic of Roma and Sinti um, genocide education. So therefore, I would like to share with you the latest findings related to the OSCE participating states. Last year, the OSCE, Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, published a report on Memorial Days, which, on Memorial Days, which is an overview of remembrance and education in the OSCE region. Here you can see the publication. Um, 
Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, the findings show clearly that out of seven, uh, 57 participating states, only 10 from those who replied have established memorial sites for commemorating the victims of the Roma and Sinti genocide. 23 states replied that they do not have any memorials, Why tw while 24 states did not even respond. We even talk, when we talk about spaces of memory, we talk about places, memorial sites, commemoration ceremonies, memorial days, but here we must not forget one of the most important of all spaces, the space in the history and educational textbooks. Yeah, no, yeah, thank you. The findings of the OSCE ODIR survey indicate that only 22 participating states have included information on the Roma and Sinti genocide in textbooks, compared to 30 participating states where the Shoah is covered, or 23 participating states that included crimes against other groups. What makes it difficult to ascertain due to limited capacity and resources is whether the existing information is included only in one sentence or one paragraph or whether the available text extends beyond one page of the textbooks. Another graph shows us how many participa participating states offer teacher training on different topics. Out of the countries that replied to this question about the availability of such trainings, 29 participating states reported uh, training teachers to teach about the Shoah, 19 states to teach about the Roma and Sinti genocide, and 17 states to teach about the crimes committed against other victim groups. The OSC participating states committed to include Roma history and culture in educational texts, including their experience during, hol during the Holocaust, uh, which is mentioned in the 2003 OEC action plan on improving the situation of Roma and Sinti. The ODIR contact point for Roma and Sinti issues has increased its efforts to promote the knowledge about the recognition of the Roma and Sinti genocide and to counter present discrimination and racism against Roma and Sinti. In 2010, we can uh, move on. Thank you. In 2010 and 2011, at the very beginning of the Roma Genocide Remembrance Initiative, the ODIR supported the Tenipe International Youth Network projects to educate Roma and Sinti youth about and commemorate the Roma and Sinti genocide in Auschwitz-Birkenau on the 2nd of August. In 2013, ODIR co-sponsored the Dikenabi Star event, where more than 430 young Roma and non-Roma from 80 countries participated at the official commemoration in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Okay. It is very important to have institutions like the OSCE, the Office for Democratic Institution and Human Rights, or the Council of Europe supporting Roma and Sinti youth initiatives working on education and remembrance in order to reach out to all states to promote awareness and recognition of the plight of our people under the Nazi rule and in countries under their influence. The International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IRA, is a key partner for the promotion and research and remembrance of the Roma and Sinti genocide. The contact point for Roma and Sinti issues provides regular input and recommendations for the Alliance regarding teaching about the <laughs> genocide. Now, coming back um, to my personal experience, I have to say that being part of this important Roma youth movement and claiming our own space for memory, 75 years after the murder of the remaining Roma and Sinti in the so-called Gypsy family ca camp, still give me a feeling of empowerment and growth. Five years ago, I came here as a participant. The following years, I supported other young Roma 
um, to come here and to join the initiative. And then I was also facilitating the educational workshops on the Roma and Sinti genocides and on human rights. And today I'm back here in Krakow. I'm a bit older, hopefully a bit wiser, but still with the same spirit and motivation that I got when I got, came here for the first time. And I, for the first time I experienced the power of belonging and the feeling of being part of the biggest European minority. I'm very happy to see the po positive development of the Roma Genocide Remembrance Initiative and to see that so many institutions and organizations like the, like the Documentation and Cultural Center of German Sinti and Roma or the European Union of Jewish Students and many other organizations support us and join us also for the commemoration on the 2nd of August. This year, we claim the space with 500 young people from 30 countries. Those people are not far from here in the university having now their educational workshops and they will join us also for the conference in the afternoon. And we are here, we are many, we are young, and we are here to learn and to talk about the history of the Roma and Sinti genocide, to talk to the Roma and Sinti who survived the genocide, and to remember and to honor those who did not. Dick and Abistar, look and don't forget. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. It is indeed fascinating that in the course of several years only, the Roma um, movement institutionalized the cultural frames of Romani uh, memory to that uh, extent. A couple of years ago, we've been still uh, talking in the future tense that that should be done. Now we can see that it's already been done. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, museums are by definition a bit conservative institutions. They are oriented towards the past. Um, therefore, we sometimes uh, should be remembered, reminded that, uh, uh, that museums are built for the future. Uh, and uh, that they should also use some uh, new technologies of talking about memories, presenting the past. And I guess that these issues will be presented in our last um, uh, speech held by Paul Fershira from Future Memory Foundation. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks to the organizers for having me. I would like to speak a little bit about also the future. Where are we going with our culture and practice of commemoration and, and memory? Um, and well, in my, my day job is, is, is in science. I'm a scientist. And this doesn't mean much. It doesn't mean we're right. But it means one really important thing. We're not afraid to be wrong. If the data tells us that things don't work or don't do what we predict, our hypothesis is wrong. And we've got to change course. Okay? This is a very core value that we also try to bring to how we conserve and present the history of Holocaust and Nazi crimes. So, well, you're familiar with the terror escape of Europe, right? This is a map drawn up by the USHMM. Over 42,000 sites have been identified across Europe as being implicated in the Holocaust in one way or the other. It was a number that shocked everybody, okay? Um, so, shortly after this event, Holocaust, Nazi crime, Second World War, in this moment of helplessness in the face of, of this massive disaster, um, you could argue that the first and second generations who were coping with this also were coping with that within their own trauma. Okay. And they have undertaken different, pro different ways, different means to try to conserve and present this history. And a very important aspect of this is, of course, also historical research. However, now we're facing a moment in time, 75 years later, that this living memory is disappearing, whether we like it or not. Whether we try to revive it with avatars or not, it's disappearing. So this is actually a very critical transition point in our commemoration culture that we should take very serious. And we should pose two questions. What have we achieved so far? How well are we doing? 
commemorating these events? And how can we improve? And if so, what are objectives in improving, if that's necessary? So our first challenge is how do we authenticate this, this history in the absence of a witness? Because if you have a witness around, you might be an expert on anything. You can tell any story you want. You can be a denier even, but the witness stands in front of you. They might have a number tattooed on their arm and they can say, I was there, I saw it. And this always has given us a calibration of the approaches we have pursued. And I think this has also saved us very often. But every year they would show up at the commemoration events and for one short moment in time, we again were projected back into that history. This we will lose forever. So if we don't find a way to authenticate our history in the absence of the witness, we're, we're going to lose the game. We're going to lose the battle. So how well are we doing? Well, actually one of the few comprehensive surveys that have been performed anywhere on the effect of Holocaust education has been done in the UK by, by um, University College London Center for Holocaust Studies in 2015 where they surveyed thousands of high school students who we know are exposed to Holocaust education in a mandatory fashion, in primary school, in their primary education, secondary education. And they just got asked, do you find this important? What do you know about it? And they all found it important. But the majority had no clue what it really meant. They had no clue about victims, perpetrators, chronology, but this should give us pause, because as we talk about the textbooks, is it in the textbook? Well, these kids were exposed to these te textbooks. They didn't really work, okay? So that's problem one. Our educational approach to Holocaust Nazi crimes is just not effective. And as a scientist who also studies education in the brain, I can tell you pedagogy in general has not been very effective. There's some fundamental challenges here. And actually last year, a comparative survey was performed in the United States addressing the general citizen. It's a very comparable outcome, but um, even a majority believing that it could happen again. Okay? So let me tell you, whatever we tried so far in the last 75 years has not worked. Okay? So, this is not necessarily, if you want, a criticism to the attempts. We have tried, okay? Collectively, we have tried. But the numbers show us it's not working. So let's take that very serious. And also, let's show some humility in the face of this challenge. And let's not persist on some dogmas that we might have pursued over the last decades. Our approaches have not worked so far. Um, so, then we have the sites themselves. Well, this is Bergen-Belsen in 2013. Here, we just heard about Letty. This is Letty in the pig farm where we did some surveying last year. Um, this is um, Danagarica and Yazinovac. This is the killing field across the river, the Sava River. And now we turn back towards the Yazinovac memorial site. And also there we did some surveying over the last few years. And where we now end up in you see on the right hand side a monument, on the left hand side we see some buildings of a museum, and in between is a sterilized physical space. And this is very much the archetypical description of most memorial sites. We monumentalized, we put down a building to have a museum, and the rest of the space we haven't touched. Okay? But it also means that a lot of the physical traces the physical evidence has been removed. In Holland, in Westerbork, they sold it off. They sold off the barracks to the local farmers. It's better to make some money than to just commemorate, isn't it? Okay. So, in Germany, in Bergen-Belsen, it was burned down partially, and the rest, the brick buildings, were just torn down by the locals to build garden sheds. Okay, so the physical traces have disappeared. It's another problem we face. Then, here I show you a network representation of all information you can find on Wikipedia about the Holocaust. It's a lot. And they're all interconnected. And you can sort of zoom in on that and, and see how different themes hang together. But the big problem here is, how valid is this? 
like how valid is this this knowledge that's available in cyberspace? Okay, so that's our that's our second our third problem. We have a lot of knowledge that's available. There's a lot of information available, but a, a lot of it, the majority, is not even digitized. It's not translated. It's not validated. And if it is, it's not accessible. I cannot just go to USHMM and ask for any random document. Many things I need special permission, or I got to pay a lot of money. And that's that's not a criticism of USHMM. That's just the the way the processes we put in place for this. Okay. I work with a number of memorial sites in our projects. I cannot get just any document. So, oh, no, 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 we're not sure whether we can release this. Okay, so we have a massive problem in the access to the, to the historical information available, its validity, and in that sense also, I think we should have a much bigger effort in making this open access, which is still a long way off. So these are the challenges we try to address. Okay, so first we try to analyze, where are we today? I think we're not in a very good spot. We can discuss that if you want, but the surveys show, and the funny thing is in many countries, no one ever bothered to do a survey because it was just a belief, we're doing great, but we're not. We haven't solved this problem 75 years later. And now it's only getting worse because now the challengers will ask us, the AFD marching again on the streets or, or the neo-Nazis marching on the streets in Germany, right, or many other European countries, or the racism again emerging and neo-Nazism also in the United States, right? They will challenge this commemoration and say, oh, it was so long ago. Why is this relevant, right? So this is now a new challenge we have to include in the answers we formulate. We have to show relevance for now and in the future. We've hardly touched that issue. So how do we deal with this? Well, first, for in the future memory project, we look at the history of the Holocaust and Nazi crimes, as you could call a chronotope. It's a very complex network of physical spaces, virtual spaces that don't exist anymore, personal stories, and context. And these we have to bring together. So as a first step, and to find authentication, we believe our assumption is, and it's an assumption, we have to test it. If, it, if we're proven wrong, we have to go somewhere else with it. But currently our assumption is, and I'll show you some signs of that later, the first thing to do is we have to reclaim the sites. So wherever we go to these 42,000 sites across Europe, we can say it happened here, where I'm standing. This is it, this is the place. This authenticates, okay? So we have to reclaim the sites as we do here in Yosinovac. So here we have um, members of the staff at Yosinovac um, going around, uh, Ivar and uh, Andriana, on the site with a tablet, and this is what they see. We project back with augmented reality the, the buildings that are there. Okay, so now we have access. Okay, we, again, we have reclaimed the space and we show what was there. And that's only the beginning. Right here we do the same thing in Letty, where we have a project uh, in, the, in the context of IC Access. It's a European project, uh, also together with people from the Bruno uh, Museum. We reclaimed the Letty space. We projected back on this empty piece of land what was there, okay? So we can reclaim the sites. And we can use mobile devices and apps for this. This is something that anyone can download anywhere, put on their mobile device, and they can go there and see it, okay? But now, how do we deal with the meaning? How do we deal with the idea of a chronotope? Well, that's how you do it, right? So in our approach, we, we impregnate the space with the history, you can find the stories, the people, the context in the place itself, right? So we want you to go around to that space with your mobile app, move about and discover its history. Okay, so this is now what we've built. So here you see, um, and this also means we have to conserve that history. So here I'm, I'm, I'm with, uh, um, Rudy Oppenheimer, who was a survivor of the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. Uh, he died, unfortunately, earlier this year. We go back into the space now, and we try to conserve the memory in that place. So we consider memory not as something that I can address as an archive. We consider memory as something that is living and reconstructive. 
and we have performed these interviews now with many, many survivors. So as a result, across a number of sites, I'll show you four examples here, the one at Bergen-Belsen, left upper corner. To the right hand side of that, it's uh, an installation we built for the Dutch National Holocaust Museum for Bergen-Belsen. The le left lower corner is a mobile application for Falstad in Norway, that's the only uh, SS concentration camp. And on the right lower corner, you see uh, a movie produced for Yazinovac that's also building on the same model that you saw earlier on the mobile app. I will uh, later on in the breaks show them in the, in the open space here that you can, if you're interested, spend a bit more time looking at them. But how we change the approach here is first, we bring the history back to the locations themselves. Okay. We allow also the user to explore that history. This is, a, for me, a very important transition, especially in education. We give agency to the learner. So far, in all our approach, we've been very normative and top-down. You were told what to think. You enter the museum, there's a linear exhibition, there's one story. And often it's a rather linear story of good and bad. It's not very effective. We know that. We must give agency to our learners to find their own trajectory to this place of, of complex, the complex historical narratives of Holocaust and Nazi crimes. So, um, so this is, an, for instance, how it's in use on the Bergen-Belsen uh, site itself. It's standard now in their educational program. Uh, all school kids of the, the, the area are now signing up for this program. The, the waiting time is now at least a year. It's completely oversubscribed because it's the only site in Germany doing this, where we try to interact with the learners with the language and tools that they're very familiar with. We're stepping away from the old model, linear exhibitions inside buildings, and democratize the access to the information, anchoring it to the historical space itself. And this has been extremely effective. Um, so, I indicate here some of the main sites where we're working. Uh, Bergen-Belsen in Germany, Falstadt in, in Norway, um, Westerbork, and also Jewish Culture Quarter in Amsterdam, in, in Holland. Uh, we, we have built a first reconstruction for Letty, uh, which works. We're working with Jezenovac, and we're also developing now models for Sobibor and Treblinka. But our goal is to reach at least 100 sites across Europe. We want to blanket the whole of Europe in its history so that every European citizen can comprehend and relate to the massive systemic scale of Holocaust and Nazi crimes and the stories it, it includes of the millions of victims, the hundreds of thousands of perpetrators, and the tens of millions of bystanders. Because this is a global story that we have to present outside of buildings and put it into the pocket of the European citizen on their mobile devices. This is our, our objective. But in order to do that, we need to get to work together across disciplines. Historians are not necessarily good educators. Educators are not necessarily good historians, as an example. Right? So we have to work together. We have to bring more technology to this. But I want to give you a little glimpse of some, some background here that relates to my day job in one minute. Okay? So, so I studied the brain. We know a lot about the brain, and it's a really magical device. It's like an extraterrestrial technology that landed in our skull. We have no idea how this works, okay? But it can do amazing things. But what we also know, the brain is a product of evolution. As such, it's not perfect. We often treat ourselves as if we're perfectly rational beings, and we know how to solve problems. No, we're not. We're filled with biases, okay? Also, we, with our good intentions to solve these problems but also our audience will have similar, if we're not sensitive to this, this inefficiency of our own existence and our own ability to solve problems, we will never get it right, okay? So we should, as I mentioned earlier, we should show humility in the face of the challenge of commemorating the Nazi crimes and the Holocaust, but also we should be acutely aware of our limitations, and we have many, okay? So we should not think that there will be one solution that solves everything here. Um, in addition, oh, well, this isn't, I'm sorry, the graphics looks terrible, but Edward Bose and Maybert Moser won the Nobel Prize in 2014 for their work on human memory systems. And what they showed is a tight coupling of human memory systems 
with action and activity. And we work closely with them. We explain some of this data. What we have shown in turn, building on their work, is that action in space is a massive modulator of memory. The active brain works very differently from a passive brain. And we are now also, we have proven this further now working with human epilepsy patients who have electrodes in their brain to, to prove the point that active brains are much more effective learners than passive brains. Unfortunately, in the current commemoration culture, we treat our audience as a passive brain. As we know it doesn't work very well. We have the evidence for that. So we really have to find new ways to deal with commemoration and build an active collective history of this horrible past so that it doesn't disperse into a gray mist of disinterest, lack of care, and also irrelevance in the future because it's too complex to comprehend. This is the time to act. We've got to act together and we should be open-minded about our solutions. We believe in the future memory approach that we, that we advocate. It's a complement. It doesn't replace anything. It's a complement that will democratize this access. And that's really one of the things we should all fight for, also in the service of the commemoration of the Sinti Roma Holocaust. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this for the presentation of this fascinating project. We are uh, five minutes behind the schedule, which is not bad. So we still have 10 minutes, 10 minutes for questions from the audience. Yes, please, Carolina. Hello, uh, I w wanted to ask about the um, museum in uh, Letopisco, which is coming up. Uh, so we are talking a lot about the coalition and, build and working together here. So I just uh, wanted to, if you could uh, mention um, how how is the process? I mean, do you work also with the international partners and with the museum with Heidelberg with the future memory here? Uh, is it uh, is is there a, a work like this going on also in building up the the concept and uh, and then the space also itself? Uh, thank you very much for the uh, question. Uh, we are working in close cooperation with uh, some of the experts uh, in Czech Republic as uh, we are working on the concept or on the documents for the architectural competition. And for the exhibition, uh, we are now preparing uh, a project which should start in these days, actually. Uh, in the project, we would uh, like to cooperate with the partners, for example, from the Washington Museum, from the Heidelberg, from Auschwitz Museum that we just uh, arrived from and uh, several other institutions and we would like to discuss uh, the concept of the exhibition with them and to find out the best way possible to build an exhibition because we are limited uh, with the funding, with the place, uh, with the sources and uh, we also want to build something that is uh, that will be there even after for example 20 years and still working and uh, that will reach as uh, largest audience as possible. So now we are trying to find out how to do it. And hopefully in a few years we will uh, have the concept of the exhibition that will be discussed with several international partners. Of, and of course uh, we are uh, members of IRA, or I'm also delegate of IRA. So we are in close communications uh, with IRA, for example, at the memorials and museums uh, working group. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate all of you uh, for your statement on, on these issues. Um, and I appreci appreciate all, yes. But I would like to make uh, one observation and one question to last speaker. Uh, because it was, I, I found it fascinating looking into the future uh, and uh, addressing the issue of uh, how to keep memory when whitenesses are disappearing. Yes. Um, so I would start from an observation. A few days ago in Gazeta Wyborcza, there was a text about the memory and politicians, about historians and politicians. 
And the conclusion of this text was that uh, historians are powerless. And uh, whatever they do, uh, uh, politicians decide about rewriting uh, history and memory. And, and the text was about current government and how they rewrite and acknowledge something which was uh, close to fascism uh, at that time, yes, of, of the war time. And they are now promoting this kind of a history. And historians are simply powerless. So my question to you is, it is something you feel as a researcher that you can work with or change or influence politicians or you feel uh, disregard all of these challenges. This is additional one which you feel powerless vis-a-vis -vis politicians. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I'm not worried about the politicians. There are massive obstacles. I, I agree with you. But so there are other obstacles. And I think the more we democratize access, right? If, if we put, let's say, apps online for people to download in, in Google Play or the, the App Store of Apple to, to discover history, I think we, we, gain, we will gain a lot of traction among the citizens and we can bypass the mechanism of control because in that sense we have to keep in mind whether you like it or not museums and commemoration sites are part of broader structures of control and it might sometimes not affect content content but in other cases it does right and also i see that that with the memorial sites we work with we sometimes also strongly feel that they they feel restricted in what they can release so i feel by, by using, if you want, the, the information space that certainly the younger generations use avidly nowadays, we can democratize access and also bypass this obstacle, and we must bypass this obstacle. We just have to do it. So I'm optimistic. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Benjamin, and I'm here on behalf of the European Youth Forum. Uh, but I need to step out of that hat for a second, because I uh, just need to comment on the last speaker a little bit. Because two days ago, I've actually been working with your app, because I'm like, also a guide in the Memori Memorial Center of Bergen-Belsen. And I'm uh, a huge fan of this app, because it really revolutionized our work there. And um, so for, for young people, it's just something they can use themselves, they can explore themselves. It's not just us teaching them for a couple of hours uh, what they will forget after, uh, at the end of the day anyway. So um, them going around, uh, having, having their own time and space to discover the place, which is highly abstract otherwise, is a huge chance for them. And I think democrat uh, democratizing the process is a very, very valid and very important point, because if you just Google the term Bergen-Belsen now, the first five, six, seven results of the concentration camps history will be accurate results at Google, perhaps, and then you will already start encountering fake news and, and things that are actually not authentic reports of the history of the camp. So it is our duty, it is the duty of, um, of the institutions, it's the duty of uh, the memorial centers to uh, gain control of the discourse and to actually provide these apps um, to, to sort of encourage young people to uh, download the authentic information um, that is providing them with the necessary tools to, to gain the knowledge that they need. So um, yeah, I really just want to promote this last aspect and hope that other memorial centers will step into the shoe and, and uh, sort of follow up because it's something that is also attracting young people. So thank you. Well, Benjamin, what can I say? Thank you very much. You're, you're right. Um, so, but please convince the, your colleagues at our memorial sites. What I can tell you, the infrastructure is free. We build it. The only thing you gotta add is content. And content must come from the local experts. So this is how we work with other memorial sites. So there is no practical limitation in using this. So if this is not used by the memorial sites in the near future, there are other obstacles there than practical access. We make it freely available to anyone. Okay, it's up to you guys to respond to that. And if you're not responding to it, you will be on my problem list. <laughs> Thank you.
uh, two, two questions. The first, the second. Ich danke Ihnen vielmals für Ihre Reden und für Ihre Beiträge, das erstmal an allererster Stelle. Ähm, ich möchte etwas zum letzten Beitrag hinzufügen. Sie haben darüber gesprochen, welche innovativen Technologien wir in Zukunft nutzen können, um die Erinnerung am Leben zu erhalten und vor allen Dingen auch das Erinnern effektiver zu gestalten, so dass die Erinnerungskultur auch tatsächlich einen gesellschaftspolitischen Effekt hat. Und ich möchte sagen, dass mir ein wenig etwas gefehlt hat und das, was mir vor allen Dingen gefehlt hat, ist, dass ich der Überzeugung bin, dass etwas sehr Wichtiges, ein sehr wichtiger Aspekt zum Erinnern ist, dass eben auch ein Dialog mit den Angehörigen der Minderheit gesucht wird. Denn in unserer heutigen Erinnerungskultur von Denkmälern und von Büchern und Texten, die gelesen werden, fehlt einfach auch der persönliche Bezug zu Angehörigen der Minderheit, die vielleicht nicht unbedingt Zeitzeugen sind, sondern eben Zweit- und Drittzeugen oder Menschen, die es innerhalb der Familie ähm, mitbekommen haben, die sich daran erinnert haben, durch die Geschichten ihrer Angehörigen. Und ich denke, dort, wo wir persönlichen Austausch fördern und wo wir aufhören, über die Minderheit zu reden und anfangen, mit den Angehörigen der Minderheit zu reden, dort nur können wir Empathie wecken und können den Effekt der Erinnerungskultur in eine Richtung lenken, die wir uns dadurch wünschen. Vielen Dank. Sie haben vollständig recht. Meine, um, so, you're right. I don't know what's easier with the translators. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, for instance, in my case, I started this whole project because my grandfather died in Bergen-Belsen as a Dutch resistance fighter, and I was just very unhappy with how commemoration was handled in that specific frame. And then, okay, it, it, you're out of control if you want. But that's why, from our perspective, we give an infrastructure where the users define content, right? So we, we in that sense, this is exactly the advantage by democratizing access, you can also reflect the huge variability of content. You can even have opposing views of different groups within a broader historical context. That's exactly what we want to achieve. That's why in our case, we deliver, we provide infrastructure to, to project this context, this historical information in, or personal information in space. But it's in the end, a group of experts representing a certain voice that develops that content. That's not up to us. We exactly, on purpose, leave that open to the user. So if we work with Letty, it's Letty that will define the content. If we would work with, let's say, Anna, on her interest, they will define the content. We, uh, on purpose, do not want to filter that in any way. That's exactly what we have to change. I completely agree with you. You're absolutely right. Thank you. I have like the last question up there, uh, and we have a comment first. Yeah, I, I think the point is well taken. Dialogue is an aspect of what's necessary. It doesn't replace history or documentation. Each one has its role. Dialogue that's not based on accurate facts can take you also in a very dangerous direction, just as misrepresenting the facts can create a situation in which dialogue has negative, negative impact. So you have to weigh at every stage the, the balance of fact, the manner of presentation or representation, as, as, which is the subject of this panel, and how it is discussed. One does not replace the other. They're all necessary. Okay, sorry. Uh, what I wanted to say is that you're completely right. Facts does not uh, replace discussion or dialogue and not the other way around. But what I I'm saying is that for the most part of history, the history was written by members of the majority and not by members of the minority. So if we are talking about facts, we should also listen to the voices of the minority and hear what is their view on the facts. Because especially in the context of history, uh, 
history is mostly written by those who uh, have an, uh, have an um, um, how can I say it, you know, who are on the upper hand and not those who are on the down hand. So what, what my family, for, for example, uh, would say that our historical facts would maybe not be in compliance with those of historians of the minority, uh, of the majority, sorry. Thank you. Unfortunately, I've been told by the organizers that we are in a position to take only one last question due to the objective limits for using this room. There is one over there that was the first person raising hand there. Yeah, um, hello, my name is Emilia. I'm from Spain. I'm from the south of the south of the south. I'm from the south of Europe. I'm from the south of Spain. I'm from the south of Andalusia. Okay, um, um, I'm a pleasure to be here. Um, I explain that because I want to say how important it is for me and for my group of persons who stay today, in, in that day here, um, to know about the uh, Romani Holocaust. Um, it's good to know the new ways uh, you explain for the um, uh, history, for the Romani history. But I am agree with her because when I was in yesterday, yesterday in Auschwitz, um, as we pick now, uh, we are so sensitive with Auschwitz. We want to, and all the people who work there um, was they they know we we we, we was there uh, to know about our history. But when we was there, not nobody who worked there. Uh, tell us about the Romani history. What mean that? We are from um, from Spain. Uh, we are traveling uh, for the principal reason to know about history for the Romani people, but nobody talk about Romani people in Auschwitz Um That was so upset for me and so sad because the people who work there, for me that people is not a person, a people is an institution. Uh, nobody talk about Romani people. For me, that was so sad because that means how the administration work with our history, work with our uh, sensitive, and that people don't didn't have any sensitive about his about our history. And I agree with her when she said um, it, the, the di dialogue is so important for us because the new ways about media will be great, will be a uh, more option for the people who live so far. But when we are here, we need to to talk with the real people like um, um, story about, about Seika, about Raymond. Um, what's so sad? Stay in Auschwitz, Birkenau. Uh, don't hear nothing about Feha, about Philomena, or about Raymond, or about. Um, in fact, the um, the person who talked with us was uh, telling us the history about three no Roma people, about a wife of a very popular violinist. Romani, Romani violinist, but he didn't, she didn't know the name of that popular violinist Romani. About the guy who, who used the register of the Romani people. Um, and we move to question. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm going to, to, to show the, um, that mean, um, how you use because we are working in our communities. We make a very good work. Uh, we are here. It's a very good sport for us to, to be here in the 75 commemoration for the Holocaust Memorial. But when we are here, we can so sad because you are not making a good work. You, you don't do your work. We was work alone. Uh, that is so difficult for us. We need to do a good work. Uh, it's not a new way. Yeah, we'll be so great. 
all the new way, but we need to go with the two we have now, and they are alive. Maybe the next year, maybe I don't know where we they don't stay here, but now we have the opportunity to be an alliance with you and us. And so important, I need a gypsy monitor, I need a Romani people to explain to me my history. Only one guy was a Romani woman to explain to me my history. And I know the 13 Barakak are closed, only open if you pay, if you say, I need to see the 13 Barakak. Why? All is my history is the history of the world. You need to open the barrack and all the people who are in Auschwitz. And for me, it's so uh, crazy. It's not only my history, it's your history too. I'm so important for you. You are so important for me. We need you out to, me, to her, to me, and to me, I need to you. You know, it, this is an alliance. It's our history. If, if that is a repeat the history, you are your fault. You, you, you will be your fault in your mind, and my fault will be too, because it's, it's two parts. I think we need to work together, but we need in the present. The future will be great, but what are you doing with the present? Because I feel, I feel it's empty. Ja bardzo dziękuję za tę wypowiedź. Ja jestem człowiekiem bardzo pokornym i wiem, że możemy poprawiać jeszcze bardzo dużo, możemy zmieniać jeszcze bardzo dużo. Wiem też, że grupy romskie zaczęły tak naprawdę pojawiać się w momencie, kiedy powstała wystawa. To nie jest tak, że ta świadomość tego, co wydarzyło się w czasie II wojny światowej, bo od roku 1945 tak bardzo wysoka i te oczekiwania były już wtedy. My możemy dużo poprawiać. Tak jak mówię, szkolimy naszych przewodników. To jest grupa 350 osób. Ja z pokorą wysłuchałem wszystkiego tego, o czym pani mówiła. Trudno jest mi zweryfikować wszystkie fakty, o których, które Pani przedstawiła. Jednak chciałbym podkreślić, jesteśmy bardzo otwarci, jesteśmy też bardzo zdeterminowani w tym, co robimy. Wiem, że historia Auschwitz bez historii romskich ofiar jest historią absolutnie niepełną. I wiem też, zapamiętałem z wystawy w centrum w Heidelbergu, takie jedno zdanie z propagandowej gazety, nie wiem, czy to był Fulkische Beobachter, czy też Stürmer, ale to zdanie mnie uderzyło, bo ono bardzo jakby odpowiada kierunkowi, w którym my powinniśmy iść z pamięcią taką komplementarną. Tam jest tak, takie zdanie, niedosłownie je chyba zacytuję po polsku, ale brzmi ono tak. Słowa Żydzi, Polacy, Cyganie wypowiada się na jednym oddechu. Oczywiście dotyczy to, jest punkt widzenia e, propagandy nazistowskiej, ale pamiętajmy, my tutaj nie dzielimy ofiar, nie mówimy o lepszych i gorszych, mniejszych i większych grupach. Podkreślamy, nie, nie mamy prawa do oceny, ale mamy prawo do tego, by przekazywać pełną prawdę, mamy prawo i obowiązek do przekazywania pełnej, możliwie pełnej prawdy o wszystkich y, ofiarach. Pamiętajmy też, że przewodnik i wizyta w Auschwitz trwa od dwóch i pół godzin do dwóch dni. I Wygląda to bardzo różnie, jeśli chodzi o pobyty studyjne i pobyty bardzo szybkie, które co innego będzie słyszeć, nie co innego, ale w innej formie będzie słyszeć grupa, która przebywa dwie i pół godziny, a grupa, która przebywa dwa dni albo tydzień czasu na warsztatach. 
nie podejmuję się w tej chwili oceny, nie znam tych sytuacji, o których pani, które pani opisała. Wiem jednak i mam nadzieję tutaj, że wesprze mnie pani doktor Talewicz Kwiatkowska i Jonathan Maksze. Myśmy się do tego solidnie przygotowywali do państwa wizyty, że jeżeli coś nie zagrało, jest mi naprawdę bardzo przykro i bardzo smutno, ale ja muszę to też zweryfikować. Mam nadzieję, że następne pobyty nie tak. My name... My name, my name, hello. Okay, my. Okay, my name is Mirabella, and uh, I can tell you I'm not agree with what you were saying with the tablets and uh, 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 that the, the museum becomes a virtual thing. We are we are uh, uh, Roma from uh, from all over the Europe here, and uh, I think you should listen to us because we are concerned about it. And I'm not agreed. Uh, why I'm not agreed with the virtual thing? That it means that. Uh, uh, we don't need any more, if you are doing this, we don't need any more to come here in Auschwitz. Why not to, to look on the internet, on the laptop, and we, we watch you on it? Why, uh, why not uh, with those money that you use it, there are a lot of Roma people that are starving. Why not to start uh, on this and uh, to, to, to give the, those money to give the, to the Roma people and to use it for, for the community and for integration and not even just for integration. I'm not a great, really, I, it's, it's awful. I, imagine. Uh, imagine when you go in uh, in uh, Auschwitz, you're not concentrating on the what uh, uh, on this. You are on the tab tablet and you are looking, and you are not anymore there. You are inside of uh, of uh, of this. Look, I understand. Just use use your money in a good way, not for this. It's, uh, d d just don't try to make business on our head on uh, on our back. F uh, find but another solution with those money, please. I, I understood. I understood your remark, but first. Maybe, maybe, let's listen to what Benjamin had to say about that. Did you hear his comment? He's a guide at Bergen-Belsen. And he's saying, it helps me to do a better job with the students who come to our site. Okay? And the point is, I'm not making business with anyone's money because I'm, I'm paying this myself. It's my money. Okay? It's not your money. You anyone's money. It's my money. But the point is... That, that do something else with no, no, look. But, but let's look at the facts, okay? I showed you the facts that Holocaust education is not very effective. We should respond to that fact, okay? And I give you one answer to that fact. If you have a better answer, great, do it, go for it, okay? This is my answer, and we have some evidence that it is having impact. If you have a better idea, do it, go for it, okay? But do it. Excuse me, I hate to break up a good discussion, but I feel, I, as an organizer, it's my responsibility to um, stop this very heated discussion. I hate to do that. I'd love for us to have more time, but we are over half an hour late with our program. So, um, first of all, I encourage all of you to continue discussing. Two, I beg everybody to keep the tone of the discussions respectful towards each other and each other's work. There is, it's an emotional topic, but let's be mindful of each other. And then, organizational matters. There is a lunch served for you outside this door. Um, unfortunately, instead of an hour and a half, you will only have one hour for lunch. And this, I beg you, please get back here at 2.30. We will have Reverend Jesse Jackson here speaking. Not only is he a legend of the African American Civil Rights Movement, but also an elderly person. So uh, we will start on time at 2.30. Please leave your headphones on the chairs. Please leave your headphones on the chairs. Thank you. For now, uh, finish the second part of, uh, of the conference.
and uh, you can uh, see the third part which will start uh, 2 30 and the third part will open the jesse jackson uh, don't forget and uh, will come on your facebook or romea cz and looking on that stay with us romea tv